Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I have a very special episode for you today. I call it UFO Car Lift Cases. As you may know, UFOs have a penchant for chasing cars down the highway. There are hundreds of cases of this kind. People report seeing a UFO, and the next thing they know, it's swooping down and chasing them down the road sometimes for miles. So this can be quite an awe-inspiring event, but the cases I want to present to you today bring this to a whole new level. These involve cases of UFOs not only chasing cars, but actually lifting them up off the road. And this can be a couple of feet to a couple of meters in height, and these cases actually reach back like 50, 60 years and are continuing to the present day. They take place all over the world. This is absolutely a global phenomena. And I'm not exactly sure what the motive is behind this, which is why I want to present these cases to you so you can make up your mind firsthand what's going on here. This is a very unusual type of UFO behavior. There aren't a lot of cases but I have over 20 that I'd like to present to you today, which I hope will bring some answers as to why exactly these cases are taking place. So, let's just get started. The first case I'd like to talk about took place in the fall of 1959 in the city of Goldfield. This is just south of Tonopah, Nevada. It involves three witnesses, friends, all teenagers, who had left their homes in Hollywood, California, just to get away and take a vacation, and they ended up in Goldfield. This is, again, in Nevada, and one of the witnesses I call Bradley. That's not his real name. He was 14 years old. He had also brought along his girlfriend, and there was one other witness. Bradley reported his case to, I believe it was New Fork, the National UFO Reporting Center, and he writes that they had pulled off the highway when their pickup truck became stuck in the sand, and their attempts to extricate themselves only ended up burying the truck more deeply until it was buried all the way up to its hubcaps. So they spent the next few hours trying to dig themselves out, but were not successful, and they decided that one of them would have to walk out in the morning, and they resigned themselves to spending the night in the desert. So they all sat in the truck stargazing and talking when their conversation eventually turned to flying saucers. And Bradley's girlfriend actually said, let's see if we can contact a saucer to help us. So they were only half serious and certainly weren't expecting anything to happen but they reached out mentally and, quote, started trying to telepathically contact a saucer. And I'll just let Bradley describe what happened next, as he says, Not long afterwards, we all saw a light approaching. I don't know the direction it came from. It just looked like a bright star, except it was moving towards us. It got much brighter as it drew overhead. At that moment, we felt the truck move. It rose straight up in the air about a foot or two off the ground, floated to the middle of the road, and gently set down. Then the light moved back in the direction it came from and blinked out. At the time, Bradley remembers that they all screamed in fear and left the area. However, 40 years later, he was able to contact his former girlfriend, and she actually confirmed the incident. As Bradley says, and I quote, The first thing she said was, What do you remember about that night? We agreed on all the details, except I remembered screaming and she remembered laughing. So this case may sound unusual, but as we will see, it is far from unique. And remember, these witnesses insisted upon remaining anonymous and they did not report the sighting until many, many years later. So they really had nothing to gain from it, and I'm sure they didn't know that there are many other cases like it. And the next case I'd like to talk about actually took place in Venezuela. This was along the Transandian Highway, 
in La Victoria outside of Merida, Venezuela. And this was a particularly scary incident for the witness. This was two years after the prior case in 1961. And the main witness is Mr. Adolfo Polini Pisano. He's a government topographer and he was driving his Jeep alone on the highway outside of La Victoria. He had just slowed down and allowed another truck to pass him. At this point, a metallic disc with a polished blue color swooped down from the sky, sweeping only a few feet above of the hood of the truck ahead of him, and then took off upwards. And as this object sped away, a huge cloud of dust was lifted from the ground, and the truck ahead of Adolfo Pisano actually rose up a few feet into the air and was pulled in the direction of the disc for just a few seconds and then crashed down, overturning onto a sandbank on the right side of the road. The driver of the truck crawled out of his overturned vehicle. He escaped with only a few scratches and cuts, but was in a state of nervous shock. This incident was actually reported to the Venezuelan National Guard, who kept the incident confidential. And Adolfo Pisano actually remained silent at first, but later felt that the case was important and decided he decided to report it to UFO researchers. Otherwise, this case would have remained unknown. So at this point, more and more people started to report these car lift cases. And the next case I found occurred in September 1965 in Brussels, Belgium. So again, all over the world. It was in September 1965 when Miss A.V. of Brussels, Belgium was driving home on a small road. This is something she traveled daily for work. She was going just under 60 miles per hour around a curve when the steering wheel suddenly seemed to malfunction, turning from left to right for no apparent reason. She thought she had a flat tire and tried to slow down but at this point, the car actually rose, she, she said, several inches off the ground. And at the same time, she saw a small glowing light only a few inches from the right side of her windshield. This little light moved quickly to the center where it remained. This was a little yellow light. She said it was tube-shaped and about 27 inches long and one or two inches in diameter. At this point, the steering wheel stopped wobbling and Miss A.V. said she had no control over her vehicle and instead it seemed to float on a cushion of air. She said it flew through the air for about 150 feet. At this point the light disappeared and the car was set back on the road. She immediately regained control and drove straight home. She was pretty shook up, too upset to even tell her husband what happened until about three days later. But hours after the incident, she noticed peculiar markings on the top side of her wrist, where she had been most closely exposed to this strange yellow light. These marks, she said, looked like tiny pinpricks. They were red, blue, and black in color, sharply outlined, and itched, much in the manner of a first-degree burn. But they disappeared in one week. She noticed no other effects and actually completely forgot about this incident. It totally left her mind. It was about a year later when she saw a glowing light next to her bed and it immediately reminded her of this incident. And uh, this is when she recalled the entire car lift ordeal and she ended up calling UFO researchers Emile Teixeur and Jean-Luc Vertonghen, who researched her case. But they were not able to uh, explain why her car was lifted up off the road. It's a very unusual case and yet another example of these bizarre car lift cases. Here's another case which generated quite a bit of interest among UFO researchers. This occurred on December 20, 1965 in Herman, Minnesota. This involved a 15-year-old witness by the name of Edward Bruns. In some accounts, it's 
they believe his name is Edward Burns, so there's some conflict about what his last name is. At any rate, it was just before midnight, and Edward was only two miles from his home when he saw a bright light ahead of him on the road. He said it hovered about six feet above the highway and was big. It covered the entire width of the road. He was driving a pickup heading west, and as he got close to this object, his car engine failed and the headlights went out. So this is something we do see in many cases where people approach a UFO in their car. And Edward said at this point the object glowed red and he saw sparks coming out from underneath it. And inside of this object he saw what appeared to be a human-like figure. So as he approached or as he got close to it and his car engine failed, this object began to rise up and to Edward's amazement, his pickup truck promptly floated up off the road, rising along with the flying saucer. He said the interior of his car was filled with a red light and the next thing he knew, his car had been turned around 180 degrees and was now facing north, lodged into a ditch on the opposite side of the road. He was quite frightened. The saucer was no longer in sight. He fled his vehicle and ran the remaining two miles home. He immediately told his father what happened, and they returned together to the scene and examined the area with flashlights. And Edward's father was amazed to see that there were no tire tracks surrounding the truck. It looked as though it had been deposited there from above, exactly as his son described. And they returned there the next morning to examine the area again, and sure enough, there were no tire tracks. So this was good evidence that it had happened exactly as Edward had described. A very bizarre car lift case. And uh, they continue year after year. December 8, 1967, Madison, Indiana. This case was investigated by famed researcher Don Worley. He's a true pioneer in this field and a really, I think, well-respected investigator. And the main witness is Martha Carnes. She's a 56-year-old nursing home worker at the time of her encounter. And it was just after midnight and she was driving down Chicken Run Road. This is near her home in Madison when suddenly a strange, orange, glowing, bowl-shaped object appeared following her car from above. Now this was not the first time this had happened to Martha. Twice earlier in November of that year, this same craft, or what appeared to be the same craft, had followed her car for several miles. And now here it was again, but this time it was different. It came down right over her car and suddenly grabbed it, pulling it into the air. Martha said she could hear a loud humming sound. She says a strange odor filled the air and she felt a sort of stinging sensation on her skin. She was unable to move her body. She was temporarily paralyzed to the point where she said she could not even turn her head. She says it felt as though the car was being sucked up into a tunnel. She couldn't feel the road at all. Um, it occurred to her she might be having a seizure, but then suddenly she felt the car tires hit the road and her car rolled to a stop. She sat there stunned, composing herself, uh, and as she examined herself, she realized her head, neck, and spine were painful and swollen. She was having hot flashes, bright spots of light swam before her eyes, and her bra, she said, was now too tight. She was quite dazed and disoriented, but drove home. And when she arrived home, she saw that her 1967 Buick, which, mind you, was less than a year old, now had a sheen of solid rust on it. And it wasn't long before more damage became apparent. All the car windows now leaked, the water hose burst, and both the battery and the radio quit working. So Martha feels that this was more than a simple sighting or a car lift. She believed she was taken on board and she later would have further encounters. So this does seem to be a good example 
in which a car lift is involving an actual onboard UFO encounter. And year after year, more cases all over the world. Here's another very interesting case, which occurred on February 18, 1969. And this is in Alberta, Canada, in a little town called Craigmile. This is quite a small town, and the main witness is a school teacher by the name of Barbara Smythe. She was driving to school, actually, when she saw a glowing red object with two white lights. She said it was quite large, about 40 feet in diameter, and this object, which had been hovering when she first saw it, began to move, and immediately her car began floating. She says the car seemed to levitate for about three minutes, or one full mile. And during this time, she felt like she was entranced. And at this point, the object disappeared, and she found herself driving along the road normally. So yeah, another very interesting car lift case. And it was just two years later when there was another incident. Uh, this was also in Canada. And this occurred on May 24, 1971, in Alberta to a Blackfeet Native American couple. Uh, the husband's name was Wilton Raw Eater. He and his wife were driving along a bumpy, unpaved road through their reservation. And without warning, their car was struck on the right side by a bright beam of light coming from above. And it was Wilton's wife who cried out, The car has left the ground. And for the next quarter mile, the car flew about two feet above the road at about 43 miles per hour, they estimate. And it was during this time that they were unable to control their vehicle. The car was set back down, the, the light disappeared at the same time, and the couple, who were quite frightened, continued their journey home. Uh, they did talk to UFO researchers. Uh, they reported no physical effects to themselves or to their car. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. Why this UFO would just lift a car up, carry it for a quarter mile, and set it down. But there's case after case like this. Here's another case, November 1973, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I will just quote the witness here, uh, as she says, and I quote, My husband at the time, and I, left a party of athletes and their girlfriends or wives. They were drinking, and the party got too wild for us. Another couple asked if they could ride home with us. The couple said they didn't like the wild party either. None of us four were drinking or smoking pot, as the others were. We left in our car. My husband was driving, and I was in the front seat, and the other couple in the back seat. We were driving toward home on a four-lane highway when all of a sudden the car started being pulled up and dropped over and over again. I thought my husband might be fooling around, and I told him to stop doing that, and he took his hand off the wheel and said, The car is cut off. It's dead. And that is when I noted that the car was not on. There was a white light over us with no noise, and it was large, hovering, and casting a large light over us and on the highway. We were scared, yelling, and holding on to each other. The car lifted up and dropped over and over. I was terrified, as was everyone else. I don't remember much of anything after that, although I think I should remember more. All I remember after that was the car started up and the light lifted up and over us and disappeared without a sound. It appeared to be a saucer shape, just lit up white. I was three months or so pregnant at the time with my now 40-year-old daughter. So this is a very bizarre case. Uh, I think it might be significant that she was pregnant at the time. ETs do seem to be drawn 
towards studying reproduction. Uh, the fact that she feels like she might have had some memory problems with this also makes me think it might be an onboard experience. Hard to say for sure, but it certainly is strange that the car was lifted up and set down over and over again. I don't know why that would happen. A very strange case. And now, one year later, Feb February 14, 1974, another case occurred outside of Eli, Nevada. And this case was very well investigated. UFO researchers were very much excited about this case. It got a lot of investigation. And it involved two brothers, both businessmen, who had rented a U-Haul truck to move their parents' furniture from Idaho to California. It was around 4.15 a.m. and they were driving on Highway 93, about 55 miles north of Eli, Nevada, or Ellie, Nevada. Suddenly, the first brother, who I called Chuck, he was driving and he observed four luminous four luminous bluish-green objects flying in a row at a low elevation to the right. One of these objects was flickering on and off, and he turned to his brother, who I called Dave, who was asleep in the front passenger seat, and said, Wake up! and told him that they were being followed by a UFO. Dave did not believe him, didn't open his eyes, and said, You're crazy! I want to sleep! So Chuck kept his silence for a few minutes, continued driving while these, while these strange objects paced their vehicle. But after a few minutes, one of them zoomed forward about a mile ahead, crossed the road from right to left, and hovered at an altitude of only 10 feet, as if waiting for the truck to catch up. So seeing this, Chuck again shook his brother and said, Hurry up! Wake up fast! Get up! I want you to see what's going on here. What is this? So Dave woke up, looked outside, and was shocked to see these objects. And as these brothers approached the hovering light on the left, it suddenly transformed into a bright orange luminous ball. And I'll just quote Dave directly here, as he says, At that moment, it felt like we had been hit by a blast of wind or force field. It felt to me like a blast of wind hit the back of the truck and it felt like it just picked it up. And we were like floating. I was sitting there in the right hand seat watching him and he just kept going like this with the truck and he couldn't steer it. He didn't have control of the truck. Chuck said that he was struggling at this point to regain control of the vehicle. As he says, and I quote, The only thing I can compare it with is if you take a curve or something on ice, how the truck sways from one side to the other. This is how it felt to me. But at the same time, the lights were flickering off and on, the motor was missing, and I was losing power. I kept my foot on the gas, and I was losing power. Now, I want to tell you that what it felt like to me was that I was actually floating. It, the truck, was floating slightly off the highway in the air. None of the wheels were touching the highway. And Dave confirms his brother's testimony as he says, The lights on the truck flickered on and off and the engine started to miss. He lost control of the truck and couldn't steer it. I told him to stop and then before we could stop, the transmission selector jumped out of drive into neutral and we coasted to a stop. At this point, the main UFO had disappeared. They got out, inspected the undercarriage of the truck, and they were shocked to see that the drive shaft was still spinning, even though the truck was in neutral and not moving. At this point, both brothers saw a large silver colored object shaped like a ball with a dome on top, they said, and sharp wings, floating over a hill to their left. However, their attention was much more drawn towards what they saw ahead of them. Another extremely brilliantly lit object landed on the center of the road right in front of them. As Chuck says, 
I saw down the road in front of us a light that covered the whole road. Just a big, big, bright, luminous light with something that was enormous in size. So he turned to his brother and said, What in the hell is that? And his brother shook his head and said, Uh-oh, they're playing games with us. And Chuck had the strong impression that they were, quote, coming to get us. So they became quite frightened. Uh, they could see other objects around them. Dave jumped out of the car and blinked a flashlight at the slowly approaching object, which responded by moving towards their truck. So his brother screamed, get back in the truck. And Dave jumped in the truck and watched as this object approached. As he says, we felt that we were in a vacuum of some kind and isolated from the rest of the world. You felt like you were trapped, in other words. Couldn't go back, couldn't go forward. The truck wouldn't move and you were just sitting there waiting for something to change. So this face-off lasted for several minutes and before the object approached any further, it suddenly disappeared. As Chuck says, it just seemed as though, I don't know, it disappeared. Something came by us real fast. So neither of them could describe exactly how this object left, just that it disappeared very quickly. They were very much relieved. They said this whole encounter lasted about 20 minutes, which is a long time for a UFO encounter. And afterward, their U-Haul truck was completely disabled they were forced to flag down another driver who took them into town and their brothers contacted the local U-Haul station owner who replaced the truck and then returned to the scene to retrieve the stranded U-Haul truck. And he had heard the brother's story and was amazed to find how badly damaged this truck was. As he says, he was interviewed by UFO researchers. As the U-Haul truck owner says, the back axle was twisted right off. He said that the drive shaft had been welded into the rear end and when they tried to haul the truck away on a tow truck, the rear wheels just fell right off. As he says, those men stopped that truck just in time. Overall, the truck ended up needing new tires, a new rear axle, new outside housing and gears all of which was verified by UFO researchers. So both brothers said that they were somewhat traumatized by the incident. As Dave says, it took about 30 days for it to sink in my mind that I really saw it. So this is not the only case where vehicles have been actually injured as a result of these encounters. Here's another case which occurred in September 1974. This was in Hobbs, New Mexico. I did cover this before in a previous episode, so I'll just mention it briefly here. This involves an anonymous farmer who was driving his pickup and had just approached his home in Hobbs, New Mexico, when without warning, a huge, quote, disc-shaped object descended over the fields about 500 feet over his barn and almost directly above him. He was amazed and leaned out of the window of his pickup truck and looked up at this object. And watching this were the farmer's wife, daughter, and a neighbor. Leonard Stringfield reports on this case. It was he who first revealed it. And as Leonard Stringfield writes, and I quote, Suddenly, before their eyes, the pickup truck with the farmer in it was lifted vertically from the ground and vanished into the underbelly of the disc. Hysterically, the farmer's wife called the police. Now, unfortunately, or for whatever reason, this farmer was never seen again. And although Stringfield writes that there's, this is a fantastic case, it comes from a very reliable source. As Leonard Stringfield says, the facts of this case, still incomplete, are in the confidential files of the International UFO Registry. The investigator in this case, a radio newsman, prefers anonymity 
Through a good source, he got the basic information about the incident from an officer, only on the basis that the names and most of the data be kept confidential until the victim was found dead or alive. So, I don't know, that's a very strange case and sort of an outlier among these cases, which are themselves outliers. But it's definitely another car lift case, so that's why I included it in this episode. So moving along in time, we now move to July 26, 1978. And this case occurred in the town of Union in Missouri. It was around 8 p.m. when Jeannie Carter and two friends were driving along Highway 50, just outside of Union, when they saw, quote, a big orange ball very bright in color in the sky. It was bigger than the moon, but much lower, and flames appeared to be coming off the left side of the ball. So there was a lot of witnesses. That same evening, around 10 p.m., Ruth Steiferman and her two children saw what appears to be the same object moving at treetop level outside their home in Union. They also called the police. One hour later, Two other witnesses in the same town saw what they described as bright lit Ferris wheels hanging in a sideways position over Highway 50, gray in color but with bright colored lights ringing the outside. They also called the police. And 15 minutes later, a lady by the name of Velma Kleins, whose house actually overlooks Highway 50, looked outside and saw what she described as an orange red ball moving at treetop level towards her house but it then veered south towards highway 50. And it was around this time that the main witness Clora Wincher was driving east along highway 50 on her way home to Arnold. She had just visited her brother in Beaufort. She was driving through downtown Union when she says a giant object appeared ahead of her on the highway. And her first thought was that it was a semi-tractor trailer about to hit her, and she braced for impact when suddenly this object flashed out a brilliant light over her car. She said the light was so bright it was blinding, and she used her left hand to protect her vision from this beam of light. And this is when the car lift uh, incident began and it didn't lift the whole car up it just lifted up the back side and left the own left only the two front wheels in contact with the ground so it's lifting up the back of the car at like a 45 degree angle and Clora said that she was actually thrown forward and looking through the windshield all she could see was the illuminated pavement of the road at this point her car began to heat up she says the windows became fogged, and her car, which was a 1974 Mercury Comet, was still moving, but shaking violently and vibrating and swaying from side to side. Clara did her best to control the car. She was able to steer, and it appears as though the gas pedal was working, but the back wheels were off the pav pavement, so she couldn't get any traction and she just steered as best as she could as this object pushed her car along the highway on its front wheels towards the upcoming bridge. After a few minutes, the light winked out and the car was set back on the road. She pulled off the road to examine her car and she expected to find severe damage but instead found only two small indentations on the trunk's lid. But she was shocked to see that her wedding ring, which she had been wearing, was now sitting on the front passenger seat. She had no idea how it got there, because normally it was on her finger and was very difficult to remove. She was somewhat disoriented. She drove home and told her husband and then filed a report with the police. And following this, she did notice a few symptoms. Her body ached. She had recurring headaches. The dental fillings on the right side of her mouth were loose, 
and her fingernails on her left hand were also loose and painful. And it was one week after the incident that she did find a spot of blood on her pillow coming from her nose, she believes. So it began, she did have some health problems. She lost a little bit of hair on the right side of her head. So it does appear that this was more than a simple car lift and that she was, in fact, uh, taken on board, considering that her wedding ring was removed. Uh, so she appears to have been a contactee, and they were basically coming to pick her up. Hard to say for sure, but it's certainly a dramatic example of a car lift case. The next case I'd like to talk about is super dramatic. One of the really typical sort of car lift cases. This occurred on September 25, 1978, outside of Buenos Aires, Argentina. The two witnesses were Carlos Acevedo. He's a 38-year-old businessman who decided to enter a cross-country endurance car race. And it was a 600-mile long race. And along with Carlos Acevedo was his mechanic. The mechanic's name is Miguel Angel Moya. And he was 28 years old. However, unfortunately, their car broke down and they had to withdraw from the competition. They got the car repaired and began the drive back to Buenos Aires. And it was at this point, somewhere along the trip, when a bright yellow light approached their car from behind and above. It moved quickly, showing a bright beam of light on the car, illuminating the interior and dazzling the witnesses. Carlos Acevedo, who was driving, said he lost control of the car, and looking out the window, they could both see that they were now floating about six feet above the road. They were disoriented and became confused about how much time was passing, but the car flew through the air for quite some time. Finally, they felt a bump and found that they were back on the road many miles from where they had been pulled into the air. The gas tank was now nearly empty and they were unable to account for at least one hour of time. They rushed to the nearest police station in Pedro Luro and reported what happened. And this case created quite a sensation. It was published in newspapers. They did several television interviews. It's a very famous case in Argentina and a really dramatic car lift case. So there, you can see this is a worldwide phenomenon. In the next case I'd like to talk about, I don't have a whole lot of information about, other than it occurred in 1979 in the California desert right along the Nevada border. This actually comes from researcher David Jacobs. And he says that the main witness, Tracy Knapp, I believe that's a pseudonym, she's a musician, had just turned 21 years old, and to celebrate, she and her girlfriends decided to drive from L.A. to Las Vegas, and it was late at night when they saw a strange light swoop down over their car. It's not clear whether they had missing time or not. However, under hypnosis, uh, a more complete scenario emerged. Tracy reported that her car was actually lifted up and taken inside the UFO. As she says under hypnotic regression, and I quote, the car is spinning around like I'm in a teacup, like I'm spinning, like the car is turning and I'm grabbing onto the seat and we're screaming. We're not on the ground. It's like we're being spun up, like we're moving forward and getting spun. And I'm holding on to the car. I feel a force, a pressure, heavy, like I'm weak and weighted. I can't talk. Nothing's being said at that point. My friends, they're going limp. They open the door and I feel like I'm being picked up out of there. So Jacobs doesn't reveal all the details about this incident, but he does say that Tracy Knapp did have further encounters. One of the most unusual car lift cases on record occurred on October 15, 1983, 
and this is just north of Altoona, Pennsylvania. At this time, there was a wave of sightings sweeping over the area, and it was around 9 or 10 p.m. when a retired receptionist by the name of Catherine Burke, age 67, was driving along Route 220 on her way home to Bellwood. She was about to exit the highway when she heard something strange. As she says, it was a weird sound, real fast. It was like a real fast hum, and it was sharp. So she looked towards the source of the sound to her right and saw a silver saucer-shaped object coming towards her. She says it was about 24 feet in diameter and about 30 feet off the ground and tilted. As she says, it was a bright silver with a pocket underneath. It was really bright, really, bri really big. So this object came straight for her car, passing directly overhead. And that's when her car was lifted up. As she says, when it went over me, it took the right side of my car up. Now at this point, the car was riding solely on the front and back left two wheels. The right side of the car was about two or three feet up in the air. Catherine tried to slide over to the passenger seat to push the car down, but she said she was unable to do so. As she says, I couldn't get control of the car. I was sliding all over the place. Uh, she tried the steering wheel, but it seemed to have no effect. She said the car headlights were blinking on and off. She was quite frightened and was really unable to see the UFO itself because she says she was too busy trying to just hold on. This was very brief. After about only three seconds, the car fell back down on the road. As she says, it came down with such a thud. And uh, in fact, the force was so great, she was almost forced under the dashboard. At this point, the car engine was now stalled. She immediately pulled off the road and stopped and watched the object disappear over a ridge. She was still frightened, so she tried to compose herself and start the car, but the engine refused to work, and it took her about 20 minutes of trying to get the car started before she finally got the engine to work. She arrived home and vowed at first to tell nobody because she thought everyone would think she was crazy. However, her daughter called and could tell that her mom was upset and got the whole story from her. And it was Catherine Burke's daughter who immediately called the police. And police chief Gregory Siaccio interviewed Catherine and said that she was, quote, visibly shaking. And only then did she discover that she actually had been injured. She had partial hearing loss in her right ear, a severe headache, and soreness in her shoulder, chest, and spine. So she was eventually referred to MUFON field investigator T. Scott Crane Jr. and uh, other investigators. They were unable to locate any other witnesses to this e event. And at the time, Catherine Burke didn't even believe in UFOs, and she thought that it might have been a secret government project. As she says, and I quote, I always said the government was trying out stuff, but I never want to see nothing like that again. It's just the idea that it was something I never saw before. I never was afraid to be by myself, and I wouldn't have been scared if it hadn't raised the car up. But it did. And this is another unusual case in that it only lifted up half the car. It's really quite strange. Here's another very brief case. This occurred on October 28, 1986, and a couple was driving in Italy near the town of Via Reggio in Lucca. And they saw a very large, dark, triangular-shaped object with four bright lights hovering over the harbor. And as they drove underneath this object, they heard a loud boom, and their car shook, and they said it, quote, went mad. 
They said the engine revved up, the car slowed down, and the back of their car was lifted upward and then dropped back down again. At this point, the object moved off towards the mountains. They reported their sighting to the Italian police and learned that several other callers had also reported the strange object. But apparently, they're the only ones who reported the, their car being lifted, or I should say half their car, just the rear end. And following this incident, the couple said that they both experienced headaches which persisted for a few days and then went away. Perhaps the most dramatic and well-known of all car lift cases on record occurred to the Knowles family of Australia. It was around 4 a.m. on January 20, 1988, when Faye Knowles and her three sons, Patrick, age 24, Sean, age 21, and Wayne, age 18, and their two dogs were traveling ac across the remote Nullarbor Plain between Madura and Mandrabilla. Sean was driving, and he was the first to notice a strange light ahead of them, and he thought it was a truck, except for, for it was just one bright light and it appeared to be just above the road ahead of him. So he shouted out to his family, Look, that's something unusual. Is that a spaceship? And his brother Patrick said, Nah, don't be stupid. Uh, Patrick thought it was just a truck. But as they got closer to this light, it revealed itself to be a large egg-shaped object and it was obstructing most of the road. It was glowing bright yellow-orange and was blocking their passage. As Faye says, it was in the middle of the road, just in the middle of the road. So Sean, who was driving, was amazed and swerved the car to try to pass it. He narrowly missed another car traveling in the opposite direction. And uh, at this point, the strange object moved to the right side of the road and began to chase the other car. As Sean says, it was moving backward and forward. So we decided to take off to have a look. It was flying miles back, and we drove miles up the road, and it was in front of us again. So this turned out to have major consequences, because the object began to uh, come towards them. It went behind them again and started to circle their car, and as they drove along, they realized it was chasing them. So Sean stepped on the accelerator, reaching soon speeds of over 100 miles per hour. He says it was the fastest he had ever driven in his entire life. All of them saw it, the entire Knowles family. As Faye Knowles says, we actually saw it. It was chasing us. As her son Sean, who was driving, said, it was a fair distance back, and the next second it was on the roof. As soon as it landed on the car, that's when my tire blew out. Smoke started coming into the car, and that's when I blanked out. So the rest of them, who were still conscious, heard a loud clunking noise and a loud buzzing noise, and the car began shaking. As Patrick says, it was a loud humming sound. Uh, the mother, Faye, says it was terrible. It was terrifying. So she looked out the window and saw this huge egg-shaped object which was actually landed on the roof of their car. And she screamed at her sons, there's something on the roof. It's on the top of the roof. And she rolled down her window and seeing this object reached out to actually touch it. And she said out loud, my God, what is it? And in a later interview she says, she described this, she said, I rolled down the window and I felt this thing on the roof. I said, there's something on top of our roof. It's landed on our roof. I don't know what to do. And Patrick said, come off it. You've got to be joking. So he was disbelieving and he, dis he decided to investigate himself. As he says, and again I quote, I opened up my window and the car started going out of control. And all this smoke, it was like smoke, all started coming into the car and my brain started to go crazy. 
I thought it was going in my head. I thought my brain was getting sucked out. Faye was still trying to figure out what this object was by actually touching it, and as she says, it was like a sponge on the roof, stuck to the roof of the car, a sponge. We were screaming and yelling. And this is when something really strange happened. They said that they felt like they were moving in slow motion. That his voice got really deep. And his voice changed. As he says, they were really deep and slow. It was so deep, it's really hard to explain. We felt like we were dying. I was really scared, scared as I've ever been. It just felt like we were dying. Faye was also terrified and she agrees with her son. As she says, we thought we were dying. We didn't know what to do. I was screaming. I was in hysterics. Wayne felt the car shaking and he saw that the car was now actually being drawn up into the air. At least a few meters, they said. As Wayne says, it was pretty scary. It started shaking and it started lifting the car up. It started lifting it. We don't really know, but we think the car was lifted off the road, uh, Faye said. We were in a state of shock. We didn't know what was going on. All of a sudden, this thing's on our roof and pulling the car up, and we don't know what's going on. So this object remained fastened to the car roof for a period they estimate of at least five minutes, at which point it set them back on the road. At this point, Sean, who was driving, woke back up. He slammed on the brakes. They skidded to a stop. The object took off and remained in view just a short distance away. The four of them and their two dogs hopped out of the car and hid behind a small tree on the side of the road and waited there for 10 or 15 minutes before they could gather enough courage to return to their vehicle. They saw that their tire was blown and uh, Sean changed the tire in two minutes flat, he said. They were so frightened they didn't even bother to retrieve the jack before they piled back into the car and took off. And during all this time, this object was still hovering ahead of them on the road. And as soon as they started moving, the object started following them again. As Patrick says, it started to follow us. And as Faye says, it was strange. It was following us everywhere. It wouldn't leave us alone. So finally, they continued driving and the object followed them until daylight arrived, at which point it finally departed. They called the police in case someone else had seen this object, because they knew there were, were other witnesses. They had seen another car. The police were skeptical at first, but saw that the entire family was emotionally traumatized, and was shortly later, several other witnesses were located, and they corroborated the Knowles story. And the police also saw that the there was strange black soot on the car, uh, strange indentations on the roof. They could see the damage to the tire. So despite all this physical evidence and additional witnesses, uh, this story did leak out and the press ridiculed the Knowles mercilessly. All kinds of theories were raised to explain their story. Some said it was a secret military test. Others said it was ball lightning. Others accused the Knowles of hoaxing the event or mass hysteria, something which they all vehemently denied. There was no evidence of a hoax ever found, nor did the various theories raised by skeptics account for the evidence. And after suffering the trauma from the event itself and the ensuing ridicule, the Knowles family ultimately regretted going public with their story but it's certainly one of the most amazing car lift cases on record. Another case occurred on June 14, 1992, in the small community of Topanga Canyon. On this evening, the entire area experienced an incredible wave of sightings involving literally hundreds of objects. Witnesses from all over Topanga Canyon and the surrounding area observed objects hovering, turning at right angles, racing across the sky, hovering over people's homes, and chasing vehicles down the highway. 
Several of these witnesses called the police. Others called the local newspaper station. And uh, some of the people who called the police, uh, one couple told a really incredible story, uh, which involves their car being lifted up into the sky. Uh, as he told the police, and I quote, because this is directly from a leaked police tape, they said, we are very shaken up and somewhat disoriented. We are almost ashamed to tell you what we saw. You'll think I'm crazy, but I don't know who to tell. Uh, the caller assured the officer that he didn't drink or take drugs. As he said, and I quote, Officer, we were driving through the canyon, where the canyon gets deep, and we noticed a bright light in the sky. And we had a very uneasy feeling, because it was moving and we both felt it was following us. All of a sudden, on top of us, was this extremely bright object. We could hear it wasn't a helicopter, it had a high-pitched sound, and we lost control of the car, and it lifted us up into the sky. It lifted us up off the ground. Now I'm telling you, I've never been more frightened in my life. The caller was near T tears and the deputy did his best to reassure the frightened witnesses and the caller concluded his report saying we were put down we lost our memory for I don't know how long maybe a couple of minutes and it wasn't there anymore I don't believe in these things I'm telling you I'm a normal human being I have a job a good job my girlfriend has a good job she's a nurse we are very disoriented we got home by the grace of God. My girlfriend was near hysterical. I don't know what to do. We are very nauseous and we feel very weak and disoriented. So the officer recommended seeking medical help and gently terminated the call. Now I did play this police tape on a previous YouTube episode of mine called Night of the UFOs. So if you'd like to hear that actual tape, you can listen to it. But what I would like to do is play a brief excerpt, and you can hear this witness tell his story in his own words.
UFO Reporting Center. Calling from Los Angeles. Yes. I've got to make this fairly short because I've got to get back to my doctors at 2.30. Um, the FAA and the Air Force gave me this number. Yes. And I'd like to report something that happened to my girlfriend and I last night, Topanga Canyon. Okay. Would you describe it, please? And by the way, we called the Malibu police and they said that three other people had reported similar things. It's just nothing that we're imagining. Okay. Um, we were driving up Coast Highway number one, Pacific Coast Highway. Are you familiar with that area? Yes, I am. And we backtracked and went, decided to go up to Panga Canyon Road, which is a, uh, it goes pretty high up into the canyon country. Do you know where Topanga Canyon is? Yes. Okay. Very familiar with it. All right. Um, there's a place where old Topanga Canyon goes to new Topanga Canyon. It's, there's a real high ledge that goes deep, deep down. You can overlook the, the, the canyon. Okay. At any rate, <laughs> this gets weirder as it goes on. Out of nowhere appeared over our car a... Uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant light that was hovering about, I'd say, 50 feet uh, on top of our car. Okay. And uh, at first we thought it was a helicopter, a police helicopter or something, except that we realized that we didn't hear any sound. And we looked up and we could see clearly the defined shape of a, uh, uh, a pie-shaped object, a saucer. I mean, I hate to you know, use that term, okay. saucer-type object. There was a rim. We could see a rim, and then within the rim was this just one big, brilliant, brilliant light that, that kept shining on our car. Okay. Was this like a beam of light? Yes. Okay. Was that in the form of a beam or a cone? Um, it was a, a wide cone. Okay. A wide cone okay. covered, uh, oh, I'd say a good, maybe 50 feet in diameter. Okay. But it was very, very bright. At any rate, we turned the car around, and we decided to go back down the canyon, and this damn thing kept following us. It kept, at the speed we were going, at the same speed we were going, it was following us. It was, it was above our car about 50 feet, okay. I'd say. And we kept looking up, and it kept it was there. And if we would go faster, it would go faster. If we would slow down, it would slow down. And we had the distinct impression that it was pursuing us. And the only noise that I could, I felt that we could hear was uh, um, the sound that a transformer would make, like a hum, All right. a high pitched hum. Okay. Then I told my girlfriend, we better get out of here. So I accelerated the car, but you know, you've got to be very careful on Topanga Canyon because it's a very windy, um, uh, it's a very windy road. And uh, when I tried to accelerate the car, my engine went out. Uh, the lights went out. Everything went out. Okay. And we got out of the car thinking that we were going to run away. I'm telling you, my girlfriend was almost to the state of hysteria. In fact, later on, I, we, we went to Cedar sinai emergency room when I got home, when we got to our home here. Um, when we got out of the car, we got even a better look at it. We, we saw that it was not a helicopter. And within, I'd say, seconds, it just went straight up in the air. And uh, as quickly as it appeared, that's how quickly it vanished. Okay. At any rate, we got back into the car, and uh, the car started, and we got down to the coast highway. We came home to Los Angeles, and my girlfriend was very, very badly shaken up. She's a nurse. I'm an accountant. Uh, we went uh, to Cedar Sinai emergency room, and uh, we had broken out on, in blisters on the backs of our hands. My girlfriend, where she was wearing a necklace, you could see the mark where the necklace was. I wear glasses. You could see on my face uh, glass, the, the glass mark. And we have uh, a, a very nauseous 
all night and diarrhea. Okay, and is that, was that like a bad sunburn? Yes. Okay. Yes, it's like a bad sunburn, but it's weepy. They're, oh. they're weeping blisters. Okay. And I sure didn't have it. We didn't have this when we went out. We. At any rate, we did call the Malibu police when we got home. And uh, they said that three other people had called uh, concerning uh, similar incidents that evening. In the same area? In the same area, the Canyon Canyon area. Okay. There was an Officer Burns that I had spoken with. Okay. And we're going to go back to the uh, doctors today at 2.30, so I can't stay too long, and I don't want to get terribly involved with the... Uh, even the doctor said I should... I, I, I could report this. I don't... I'm not prone to these far-out situations, sir, but it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. It was really quite frightening. Okay. That was your girlfriend at RN? Yes, she's a registered okay. nurse. Now, what she time worked, did that occur? It occurred, a, I would say, approximately at 12.30 okay. in the evening. That's this morning? Yes. Mm. My girlfriend works at the Wadsworth Veterans Hospital. Oh, okay. What was the name of that Veterans Hospital? The Wadsworth Veterans Hospital. Okay. Now, do you have any estimate of the diameter of the object? It was about 50 feet in diameter. Okay. Now, do you remember the color of that uh, cone of light? Um, white. Okay. White with, uh, um, yeah, but there was some blue in it, blue around the edges. Okay, now when you were exposed to that uh, beam of light, did you detect any change of temperature? No, but our skin tingled. Okay. And it felt like there was a little, I don't know, electrical feeling in, in your skin. Okay. And then for a brief moment, to tell you the truth, neither of us even could remember what happened. It was almost as if we had blacked out. Did you feel that that was a very short duration? I think so. I have no way of knowing. Okay. Did you detect any unusual odors at the time? Come to think of it, yeah. Uh, um, I would say like burnt cinnamon. Okay. Did you have any trouble restarting your car? At that point, I can't, to tell you the truth, I can't remember. Okay. I, I, I don't know. I think maybe a couple clicks and started. I can't remember. Okay. Have you seen any other problems with the car since you got home? No. Okay. Now, were there any other unusual physical traces uh, with you or your lady friend? No. Okay. And how long do you feel this entire uh, incident went on? I feel that it followed us for about 10 minutes. Okay. And then out of the car, maybe a minute or so. But it was when we were out of the car is when I kind of, kind of lost track of what was going on for a while. Okay. Do other people report things like this? Well, yes, sir, they sure have. They've been reporting them for years. Now, what was the name of the doctor you were going to? Well, we went to the, the Cedar sinai emergency room, and I don't re recall the, oh, the name okay. of the doctor. Okay. Uh, it's because of my job, I really don't want to get uh, I understand. visible. Because when you talk to, when you talk about this to people, we are going to go see a psychiatrist. Just, to, I mean, I don't. We, I don't, we, we, weren't, we weren't hallucinating. I didn't make this rash up. Yes. Okay. Can I get your name? Sir, I don't want to give my name. Okay. Is there any way we can get back to you if we need more information? Well, what more information would you need? I'll, I'll, I'm going to go back to the doctors. I can't call you back. It's just that my wife, my girlfriend has a uh, governmental job. And right. You've got, you've got to understand, this is of such high strangeness that people tend, if it gets out, um, they tend to look at you as if you're weird or something. I understand. 
Okay, what we would like to do after you visit your doctor, if you feel like it, uh, we'd like to uh, hear what his diagnosis of the uh, injuries is. And what do they do with all this data? What do we do with it? Mm -hmm. Well, we compare it with other similar cases over the past years, mm -hmm. which gives us a basis for determining the reality of what is going on. Is this something that the government is doing? No. No, the, uh, this type of incident has occurred uh, off and on throughout the United States and overseas for the last 40 years. I've read about things like this, but reading it is one thing, but when you see it firsthand, I, I don't know how to explain it. I just I don't know how to explain it. It can be very traumatic. And other uh, other people do call you. Oh yes, we get uh, we're averaging about six calls or six reports a day right now, and that's very very quiet. We cover all of North America. Well, what is thought? What is this thought to be? Well, there's of course three or four different uh, theories. Uh, my own personal opinion is that uh, these are objects coming in from outer space. I've been studying the subject for 36 years. Jesus Christ. So as you can see, that's pretty amazing first-hand eyewitness testimony of a car lift. And this wave of sightings continued for another two years, till 1994 at least. And many other people reported being chased in their cars by these objects, but no one else reported being lifted up into the sky. I just have a few more cases I'd like to share with you today. Uh, so, th I mean, there are dozens of cases. And the next case I found occurred in 1994 in the Rio Grande County, just north of the New Mexico border. This comes from Colorado-based researcher Christopher O'Brien, who spoke directly with the witness, Alan, who told him that his, he and his family had been seeing, quote, every kind of ship you could imagine. These objects, these UFOs, Alan said, were flying all over the desert area surrounding their home. Large ships, small ones, triangular-shaped, disc-shaped craft. And as Alan says, and I quote, my mother found out that they would come closer if you called to them in your mind. So this really intrigued Alan and he wanted to try to communicate with the occupants of this, these craft. So one evening in 1994, Alan and his friend went out to watch these objects darting around. They sat in the friend's pickup truck and waited to see if anything would show up. And sure enough, early in the evening, uh, as Alan says, and I quote, a strange bank of fog rolled in. They saw an object and it approached about 600 feet away. And as Alan says, I started to call it closer, and it approached and just sat there about 50 feet away. Well, my friend kind of freaked out, grabbed his rifle from the rack, and popped off a couple of shots at it. It went above us, and somehow it lifted up the truck and pulled it into the far ditch. So this could have been a reaction to the boys actually shooting at the UFO. Probably not a good idea. And maybe that's why it swooped down and lifted up the car. Uh, hard to say, but it's a good example of a UFO car lift case. Here's another brief case in the same general area one year later. This occurred in July of 1995 uh, to an anonymous witness. I'll call him Larry. Uh, this was also in the Rio Grande, Colorado area. Uh, he had just experienced a close-up sighting of a UFO over his truck, and this was followed by a period of missing time, and when he regained consciousness, he discovered a very strange mystery. He exited his truck and found that it was now sitting, quote, six inches away from its tracks. It looked as though his truck had been lifted up and set a half foot to the side. And not only that, 
The tops of the trees nearby had been sheared off. These were 60 foot high trees. So not only was his truck moved, but also his bulldozer and trailer were also moved the same distance. Another case occurred four years later, July 12th, 1999, and this occurred near Elko, Nevada. The anonymous witness had just finished tuning up his truck and wanted to take it on a long drive to make sure everything worked. It was around 7.30 p.m. He had been driving for about an hour and a half and was between Elko and Carlin near the Independence Mountains when he noticed a, quote, huge black mass that he said was blocking out the stars. Now on the bottom of this object, there were dozens of little lights that appeared almost star-like, and he felt as if the object was almost trying to camouflage itself. He became alarmed, immediately stopped his truck, turned off the engine, and got outside to observe. And as he watched, this craft approached him and stopped directly over his vehicle. He became frightened and jumped into his truck, turned on the ignition, the engine roared to life, and I'll just let the witness describe what happened next. As he says, the truck wasn't moving. I realized that the truck was in the air about five or six feet. I was going to jump, but then the truck came crashing down. I sped away. I was amazed and really happy that my truck survived the fall. I drove to Carlin and spent the night there. The next day, I checked out my truck, and I only broke some bushings, a front brake caliper, and two back brake drums. So there you go, another case involving physical damage to the vehicle which had been lifted up into the sky. So I have just one more case I'd like to present to you today. This is a really dramatic case and quite recent. This occurred on March 20th, 2010. There were two witnesses who are anonymous. One is 16-year-old David, known only really as D, and 18-year-old I did discover her real name, but it's clear she wants to be anonymous, so I'm not going to use her real name. At any rate, they decided to take a drive in the town of Laconia, New Hampshire. They were dating and looking for a place where they could be alone, and there was a little local parking lot near Opichi Park, which was often frequented by young couples. And as Dave says, there were eight cars there already when we arrived. The cars started leaving one by one, and we were the last car in the parking lot. It was then that something very strange happened. As he says, the lights of the parking lot and the lights of the houses around us and the lights of the houses down the street started to go out one by one. And it was then that Melissa noticed that there was a weird black object overhead between them and the moon. And she said, what was that? Dave observed the object in awe. He saw that it wasn't a cloud because it was moving against the wind. And when it moved slowly, it became ball-shaped. But when it moved fast, Dave said it looked like a flat plate and it was covered with dim yellow white lights. And he told his girlfriend, if it gets any closer, we need to leave. So she watched it closely, and as she says, it moved back across the moon. It was huge, and it looked like it was zigzagging or changing shape. I couldn't tell. And Dave said, I think it's coming closer. He said it appeared to be tumbling or flipping end over end and she felt a rush of fear as this object quickly approached them. As she says, it flew so fast over the trees, getting closer to where we were. It felt like it was zeroing in on us. It blocked the moon. As Dave says, it suddenly crossed the street towards our car, and it was only then that he realized how big this object was. 
he says it was like about 14 houses put together. And uh, at this point, they both pretty much panicked. Dave started the car and screeched off. Uh, as he says, I did not have time to turn on the headlights. So they just wanted to get out of there. And Dave was driving crazy, scared Melissa. She thought they were going to hit the building, but Dave turned to the left just in time to avoid a collision. And that's when it happened. This is when their car suddenly left the ground. As Melissa says, and I quote, it felt like we went off a jump. You know that feeling? Like we were on a roller coaster and we were in the air. I was trying to pay attention to everything that was going on, but I felt like I couldn't. And when I looked up, everything was black. I heard absolutely nothing. It was silent. I felt immobilized, like I had no control over what I was doing. I could see nothing. It was like opening your eyes in a pitch black room. Dave confirms this, and as he says, the front end got picked up, and the car would not move. We steered left and right, but the car just kept on going up in the air. My girlfriend was scared. I was screaming. The car was going up, and the back wheels were off the ground. And then I looked out the window, and I saw that the parking lot started getting smaller. So Dave watched in disbelief as cracks spread across the windshield from the passenger side to the driver's side, and the entire windshield appeared to be coming loose. And as Dave says, the whole time in my head, something was telling me, don't be scared. It wasn't a language. I don't know how to explain it. So he's clearly describing a telepathic message here. And he looked over and saw that his girlfriend was actually dangling outside the car window, hovering about a foot and a half above the car seat. But most amazing, the car was pointing straight up. And looking up, Dave saw nothing but blackness. And when he tried to look at the object itself, he said something really strange happened. As he says, Every time I tried looking at it in front, a white film went over my eyes. I could not hear Melissa screaming, but I knew she was screaming. My ears felt like they kept popping from the altitude. So Melissa was pull, pulled out of the passenger side of the car, and Dave says he felt something grabbing his left wrist, wrist and begin to pull him out of the window. As he says, there was no pain, but it was strong. They both noticed a strange odor. Dave says the smell was unbearable. It was spicy like pepper spray and clean at the same time. It was a smell that you could stand, but you would close your nostrils because it still feels bad. As Melissa says regarding this odor, it was not nice. It was an odor I've never smelled before. I felt really nervous and scared, but I don't remember crying or screaming. So Melissa is trying to hold on to the center console, and as she says, when I finally realized what was happening, I was so close to the windshield that my body was going forward with my arms behind me. Everything was black, and I heard a, no a noise like a horn. And Dave also heard the horn going off, so this was apparently the car horn. And he said it was really strange, because every time the car horn went off, this force that was holding them seemed to weaken. And they would sort of flop back down towards the car. As Dave says, we realized we were still up in the air. It took two seconds for the car to drop, and when we dropped, the airbags came out. So his girlfriend agrees, as she says, the car just dropped. I hit my eye on the dashboard, and the airbags came out. I held my face, and I looked over at my boyfriend, and I saw that his left arm had blood. So she turned to him and said, are you okay? And Dave just sat there silent and stunned. They both could see that the windshield was cracked all the way across the passenger side. This weird smell still filled the car. Dave put the car into gear and they drove off as quickly as they can, as quickly as they could. The smell began to dissipate. 
Melissa broke into tears and said, what the hell just happened? And Dave was weeping and cursing and said, I don't know, I don't know. And they both cried as they raced to her mother's house. Neither of them felt like the object was following them, but neither of them understood what had just happened. As Dave says, it seemed like we were in the air for 10 minutes, but it felt like forever. So as they pulled up to Melissa's mother's house, she could hear her daughter freaking out. Melissa said, I couldn't stop crying. Her mother said, just calm down and tell me what happened. And she said, you're never going to believe me. And her mother said, is it my car? What's wrong? And Melissa said, well, let me explain. And she said she could feel the memory of this incident starting to leave her mind. As she says, I felt that if I didn't explain it fast enough, it was just going to go away from my mind. So she very nearly had missing time, but she recalled it. And she told the whole story, and after hearing this, Melissa's mother decided to call the police. It was now 15 minutes after midnight. An officer arrived and took down their testimony, and he was skeptical at first until he examined the car. He saw that the airbags were deployed, the windshield was cracked, but the vehicle itself appeared to be otherwise undamaged. And that he found quite puzzling because it was obvious that it would take considerable force to deploy the airbags and destroy the windshield. At this point, Dave pulled out his cell phone to make a call, and as he opened it, he says an electric arc from the phone um, zapped out and shocked his hand. And the officer said that he would investigate the area where this incident happened the next morning, and uh, told the Dave that he should take a shower and get the airbag dust off of him or actually he told that to Melissa. He told Melissa, go take a shower, get the airbag dust off of you. But Melissa declined as she says, I didn't want to be alone at all. So they did have a few bumps or bruises, but were otherwise unhurt. And Melissa, I mean, she didn't have a scratch on her and the blood that she had seen on her boyfriend's arm was completely gone. She did have a weird dream uh, that night where she was back in elementary school and was unable to talk while everyone else was speaking for her. She says it did not feel right at all. And it was a few days later that Dave went to his doctor and he documented a puncture wound, or what appeared to be a puncture wound, on his forearm and a semicircular incision. So they both felt some residual emotional trauma Dave felt very uncomfortable being outside at night. He did not like the feeling of a car driving, especially when the road became bumpy. And Melissa herself said she really did not want to go outside anymore because, as she says, I'm scared. So this case was thoroughly investigated by MUFON field investigator and New England State Director Steve Fermani. Uh, he examined the vehicle as well, and he determined that after this object was pulled into the sky, it was actually set down 180 feet away from its original location. And an inspection of the parking lot where the incident occurred did reveal scars on the ground, which appeared to be consistent with their vehicle being dropped down from above. And they also discovered that the car was, in fact, more damaged than they had originally estimated. They found out that the undercarriage of the car sustained an estimated $5,000 in damage. So here we have another case involving solid physical evidence. And that is all of the cases. There you go. That's this episode for you today. I hope you've enjoyed it. All of these cases I did present in my new book, Not From Here, Volume 4. And as you can see, there are enough cases where I think they warrant serious attention. Why are UFOs lifting up cars off the highway? I think it's clear in a number of these cases, people are being taken on board.
but I'm not sure that's true in all of these cases. It could be, but it seems like in some of them, the UFOs are just lifting them up in sort of a display, showing off what they can do, or perhaps trying to impress the witnesses in some way. I am honestly not sure, but these cases sure are really interesting because this shows a type of UFO behavior you don't often see. I can only imagine how it must feel to be driving down the highway when suddenly you find your car floating off the road. So, I uh, hope you've enjoyed this episode. I really appreciate you watching. Thanks very much, and until next time, keep searching for answers, keep looking for the truth, and most important, keep having fun.